Basic Helping Verbs in English from EspressoEnglish.net Helping verbs or auxiliary verbs don't have a specific definition. They help the main verb of the sentence. In this lesson, you'll learn how to use the basic helping verbs do, be, and have. Use the helping verb do to ask questions. Do you like ice cream? Does Bill have a dog? Did you go to the party? Use do in the present tense with I, you, we, and they. Use does in the present tense with he, she, and it. And use did with all forms in the past. When the question has a question word, you still use do after the question word. For example, where do you live? What time does the bank open? Why did she go home early yesterday? We also use do to form negative statements. I don't like ice cream. Bill doesn't have a dog. We didn't go to the party. Avoid the common error of using no or not as the helping verb. I no like ice cream and I not like ice cream are incorrect. You need to say, I don't like ice cream. Helping verb number two, be. Use be to form continuous tenses with the ing form of the verb. In the present continuous, be takes the form of am, is, and are. For example, I'm studying English. He's talking on the phone. We're having dinner now. In the past, it takes the form of was and were. He was singing in the car while we were driving home from work. And in the future continuous, it takes the form of will be. Tomorrow morning, I'll be teaching an English class. When you ask a question, the word order is different and the helping verb comes before the subject. For example, is he talking on the phone? The helping verb is comes before the subject he. When you make a statement, this order is reversed. He is talking on the phone. Here's another example. Were you having dinner? The helping verb were comes before the subject you in the question form. In the statement, the order is reversed. We were having dinner. Helping verb number three is have. Use have to form perfect tenses. In the present perfect, use have and has. I've finished my homework. She has just left the office. In the past perfect, use had. He said he had bought the tickets. And in the future perfect, use will have. By this time tomorrow, I will have finished this project. The future perfect is not very common in English. Again, when you ask a question, the word order changes. Have you finished the work? I have finished the work. Has she left the office? She has left the office. Had he bought the tickets? He had bought the tickets. If you're ready for something more advanced, go to the bottom of this lesson and click the link for modal helping verbs, where you'll learn how to use can, could, might, would, and other modal verbs. Thanks for watching English Tips from Espresso English. If you liked this video, please share it. Modal Helping Verbs in English from EspressoEnglish.net Modal helping verbs modify the main verb by adding necessity or possibility. 
In this lesson, you'll learn how to use can, could, may, might, must, should, will, won't, and would. Use can and could to express ability and possibility. I can swim means I have the ability to swim. We could go to the movies means it's possible for us to go to the movies. You can also use them in the negative form to express no ability or no possibility. You can't enter the restricted area. This means it's not possible. He tried to call me, but he couldn't get through. Couldn't means it wasn't possible. Use may and might to express the idea of maybe. We might go camping, depending on the weather. This means if the weather is good, we will go, and if the weather is not good, we won't go. I may go to the gym if I can get off work early. Again, it's not a certainty, but maybe I will go, depending on my work. Use should to give a recommendation or suggestion. If your head hurts, you should go to the doctor. This means I suggest that you go to the doctor. He should see that movie. He'd like it. This means I recommend that he sees the movie because I think he would enjoy it. Use must to express necessity. That means something is required. You must arrive on time for the exam, otherwise they won't let you take it. It means it is necessary to arrive on time. In spoken English, it's much more common to use need to and have to for requirements instead of must. You can also say, you gotta arrive on time, but this is very informal and is used in spoken English only. Gotta is never used in written English. Use will and won't to express certainty about the future. I'll help you write the report means I promise to help you write the report. That software won't work. It's not compatible with the computer. This means I am certain that the software will not work. Finally, use would to express an imaginary situation. If I were a millionaire, I would give a lot of money away. Dana would study English if she had more free time. Both of these situations, being a millionaire and having more free time, are imaginary. They are not real, so we use would to describe what would happen in this imaginary situation. In spoken English, we normally shorten the word would. If I were a millionaire, I'd give a lot of money away. She'd study English if she had more free time. When asking a question using a modal helping verb, the word order changes. I can swim is the statement, but when asking a question, the modal verb comes before the subject. Can you swim? Here's an example with could. Could we go to the movies? The modal verb could comes before the subject we, and in the answer, it's reversed. Yes, we could. You should see that movie. Should I see that movie? I would give money away. What would you do? In questions, always put the modal helping verb before the subject. Thanks for watching English Tips from Espresso English. If you liked this video, please share it. Irregular Verbs in English from EspressoEnglish.net Did you know that about 70% of the time when we use a verb in English, it's irregular? 
Irregular verbs can make you go crazy, but in fact they follow some patterns. In this lesson, you'll learn groups of irregular verbs that will help you remember them better. The first group is irregular verbs with all three forms identical. These verbs are the same in the present, past, and past participle. One example is put. Present. I always put the milk in the refrigerator. Past. Yesterday I put the books in my backpack. The present perfect uses the past participle form. I've already put the documents in the mail. Other verbs with all three forms identical include bet, burst, cost, cut, fit, hit, hurt, let, put, quit, set, shut, split, and spread. The next group is verbs with identical present and past participle forms. The only different form is the past. Come, came, come. Become, became, become. Run, ran, run. A number of irregular verbs have N in the past participle. These can be divided into four subgroups, with O in the past and past participle, with O in the past only, verbs with the past form ending in EW and the past participle in OWN, and other. Subgroup 1. Break, broke, broken. Choose, chose, chosen. Forget, forgot, forgotten. Get, got, gotten. Speak, spoke, spoken. Steal, stole, stolen. Wake, woke, woken. Wear, wore, worn. In this subgroup, the vowel changes to O in the past and past participle. Subgroup 2 has O in the past but not in the past participle. Drive, drove, driven. Ride, rode, ridden. Rise, rose, risen. Write, wrote, written. Notice that the sound of the I changes from the present to the past participle. The present is drive, and the past participle is not driven, but driven. Subgroup 3. Verbs ending in EW in the past and OWN in the past participle. Fly, flew, flown, grow grew, grown, know, knew, known, throw, through, thrown. Finally, we have subgroup 4, other. These verbs have N in the past participle, but don't appear to follow any other pattern. Bite, bit, bitten, hide, hid, hidden, eat, ate, eaten, fall, fell, fallen, give, gave, given, see, saw, seen, shake, shook, shaken, take, took, taken, Another group of irregular verbs is verbs with pronunciation changes, for example, long e to short e. Keep, kept, kept. Sleep, slept, slept. Feel, felt, felt. Bleed, bled, bled. 
feed, fed, fed, meet, met, met, lead, led, led. Another group has e a pronounced differently from the present to the past and past participle. Deal, dealt, dealt, mean, meant, meant. Read, read, read. Hear, heard, heard. Another group is when the long i changes to o u. Bind, bound, bound. Find, found, found. Grind, ground, ground. Wind, wound. Wound, short i can change to u. Dig, dug, dug. Stick, stuck, stuck. Spin, spun, spun. Sting, stung, stung. Two very common verbs, sell and tell, become sold and told. In the past and past participle. Finally, we have the verbs with ought endings in the past and past participle. This can be spelled o u g h t or a u g h t, but the pronunciation is the same. Bring, brought, brought, buy, bought, bought. Catch, caught, caught. Fight, fought, fought. Seek, sought, sought. Teach, taught, taught. Think, thought, thought. Remember that the G is silent in these verbs. Verbs with three different vowels. In this group, the vowel changes from i to a to u. Begin, began, begun. Drink, drank, drunk. Ring, rang, rung. Shrink, shrank, shrunk. Sing, sang, sung. Sink, sank. Sunk, spring, sprang, sprung, swim, swam, swum. Finally, we have the completely irregular verbs. These verbs don't follow any specific pattern, so you just need to memorize their past and past participle forms. The verb to be is am, is. Or are in the present, was or were in the past, and been in the past participle. Do, did, done. Go, went, gone. Have, had, had. Make, made, made. Thanks for watching English tips from Espresso English. If you liked this video, please share it. English pronunciation practice: 105 regular verbs with ed in the past from EspressoEnglish.net. Many English learners make pronunciation mistakes with the ed ending of regular verbs in the past simple tense. There are three ways to pronounce ed in English, like t, like ed with an extra syllable, and like d. Let's practice with some examples. Ed is pronounced like t after verbs ending with a k sound. Asked, checked, kicked, liked. Looked, talked, 
thanked, walked, worked. ED is also pronounced like T after verbs ending with an S sound. Confessed, crossed, dressed, embarrassed, guessed, impressed, increased, missed, passed, promised. Remember that the letter C in English can also have an S sound. Announced, danced, forced, influenced, introduced, noticed, reduced. ED is pronounced like T after verbs ending with an SH sound. Brushed. Crashed, punished, pushed, rushed, and after verbs ending with a ch sound, matched, punched, reached, searched. Finally, ed is pronounced like t after verbs ending with an f or an x sound. Laughed, fixed, relaxed. The second pronunciation of ed is like ed with an extra syllable, after verbs ending with a t or d sound. Accepted, appreciated, cheated, connected, excited, interrupted. Invented, rejected, started, waited, avoided, decided, ended, expanded, guarded, included, needed, pretended, reminded, succeeded. The third pronunciation of ed is like d with no extra syllable. Ed is pronounced like d after all other verbs that don't fit in the first or second categories. Here's an example of the difference in pronunciation two and pronunciation three. The past of appear is appeared. Appear has two syllables, and appeared also has two syllables. Don't pronounce it appeared with three. This is different from the verb accept. The past of accept is accepted. Accept has two syllables, and accepted has three syllables. ED is pronounced like D with no extra syllable after verbs ending with an R sound. Appeared, compared, considered, entered, remembered. It's also pronounced like D after verbs ending with a V sound. Arrived, received. Observed, improved, saved. Ed is pronounced like D after verbs ending with a Z sound. Advised, buzzed, paused, raised, sneezed. Ed is pronounced like D after verbs ending in an L. M or N sound, killed, pulled, traveled, claimed, jammed, burned, examined, explained, turned, warned. ED is pronounced like D after verbs ending in a vowel sound. 
borrowed, annoyed, cried, glued, carried, weighed. Finally, ed is pronounced like d after verbs ending in a b, g, or j sound. This is one of the most difficult to pronounce, so let's practice. Robbed. Scrubbed. Belonged. Hugged. Arranged. Encouraged. Challenged. Judged. Managed. Let's review. ED only has an extra syllable after verbs ending in a T or D sound. Want, wanted, decide, decided. With these verbs, the ED adds an extra syllable. In all other verbs, the ED does not add an extra syllable. Miss, missed. Receive. Received. Thanks for watching English Tips from Espresso English. If you liked this video, please share it. Common English verbs have. There are two ways to make the negative form of the verb have. Don't have or doesn't have and haven't and hasn't. When have is the main verb, meaning possession, then the negative form is don't have and doesn't have. For example, I have a car. I don't have a car. It's incorrect to say I haven't a car. Here's an example with has. She has a dog. She doesn't have a dog. It's incorrect to say she hasn't a dog. When have is the auxiliary verb, like in the present perfect, then use haven't and hasn't. I haven't finished my homework. She hasn't spoken to me for three weeks. Now let's learn the difference between have and have got. Either one can be used when have is the main verb in the case of possession. For example, do you have a pencil? Have you got a pencil? She has a lot of work to do. She's got a lot of work to do. These sentences are all correct. Have got can only be used in the case of possession when you own an object. You can't use have got in expressions like have breakfast or have fun because these are not objects that you possess. I have breakfast at 6 a.m. I had fun at the party. Thanks for watching English Tips from Espresso English. If you liked this video, please share it. Learn English Verbs Common Collocations with Parts of the Body from EspressoEnglish.net One of the best ways to learn English vocabulary is through pictures. In this lesson, you'll learn verbs for common actions you can do with your body. Nod your head. Shake your head. When you nod your head, you move your head up and down. This means yes or I agree or I approve. When you shake your head, you move your head from side to side. This means no or I disagree or disapprove. Turn your head. To turn your head is to direct it to one side. We can also say turn towards when the person turns to look at something and turn away when the person turns in the opposite direction. Roll your eyes. If you roll your eyes, it is often when you are annoyed, when you want to be sarcastic, or when you think something is stupid. Be careful with this gesture because it can be impolite. Wink. Blink your eyes. You wink when you close only one eye and quickly open it again. This means something is funny or cute. Sometimes people also wink when they are romantically interested in another person. You blink when you close both eyes and quickly open them again. This gesture doesn't have any particular meaning because we do it constantly.
Raise an eyebrow. Raise your eyebrows. When you raise an eyebrow, only one eyebrow, it means you are curious, suspicious, or skeptical of something. When you raise your eyebrows, two eyebrows, it usually means that you're surprised. Blow your nose. When you blow your nose, you clean out the contents of your nose into a tissue or handkerchief. Stick out your tongue. Children often stick out their tongues to be silly or to tease another child. Depending on the attitude of the person doing it, it can also be rude. Clear your throat. Clearing your throat is a sound like this. <clears throat> Many people try to clear their throat when they are sick, but it can also be used in social situations to get someone's attention. Shrug your shoulders. You can shrug your shoulders to say, I don't know, I don't care, or it's not important. Cross your legs. Crossing your legs doesn't have any particular meaning. It is just a way to sit. Cross your arms. In some cases, crossing your arms can be neutral, but it's also possible to cross your arms to show that you are angry. Keep your fingers crossed. Keeping your fingers crossed has a special meaning in English. It means to hope for good luck or a positive result. Give the finger. Giving the finger is an extremely rude gesture. Another idiom for it is flip off. Give the thumbs up. Give the thumbs down. If you give the thumbs up, it means you approve of something or you think it's great. If you give the thumbs down, it means you disapprove of something or you think it's terrible. Visit www.espressoenglish.net for more English tips. If you like this video, please share. Stative verbs, action verbs, and verbs that are both from EspressoEnglish.net Action verbs or dynamic verbs are verbs that describe actions. We can use them in the simple or continuous forms. Here are some examples of action verbs. Every day I walk home from class. I'm walking to the store right now. I read mostly historical fiction. I've been reading a novel that takes place during colonial times. My sister helps me with my homework. My father is helping me learn how to drive. Bob watched four hours of TV last night. Last night he got angry because I changed the channel while he was watching his favorite show. Stative verbs or state verbs describe a status or quality of something, not an action. Verbs of perception, opinion, the senses, emotion, possession, and state of being are often stative verbs. Stative verbs cannot be used in continuous form. Here are some examples of stative verbs with opinion or perception. I've known my best friend since childhood. Don't say, I've been knowing. We agree with you. Don't say, we're agreeing with you. He doesn't understand the article. Don't say, he's not understanding the article. Here are some examples of state of verbs with possession. You can say, I have a bicycle, but not, I'm having a bicycle. Say, this book belongs to the teacher, not, this book is belonging to the teacher. Our tour included a visit to the museum, not, our tour was including a visit to the museum. Here are some state of verbs involving perceptions of the senses. I hear some music playing, not I'm hearing some music playing. This perfume smells like roses, not this perfume is smelling like roses. He seemed upset last night, not he was seeming upset last night. Here are some more state of verbs with opinions. Say, 
I love ice cream. Not I'm loving ice cream. She has he has always hated jazz. Not she has always been hating jazz. They need some help. Not they're needing some help. Again, because state of verbs describe states of being, not actions, they cannot be used in continuous form. Here are a couple more examples of state of verbs describing states or qualities. This piece of meat weighs two pounds. Not this piece of meat is weighing two pounds. The box contained a pair of earrings. Not the box was containing a pair of earrings. Success depends on your effort. Not success is depending on your effort. This class will involve lots of research. Not this class will be involving lots of research. Some verbs can be both action verbs and state of verbs, depending on their meaning and context. Here's an example. The verb be. If you say he is immature, be is a state of verb, meaning he is always immature. But if you say he is being immature, then be is an action verb, meaning he is temporarily acting immature. Have can also be both a state of verb and an action verb. It's always stative with possession. For example, I have a car. He has a dog. But in certain expressions with have that do not involve possession, have is an action verb. For example, I'm having breakfast, meaning eating breakfast, or he's having fun, meaning experiencing fun. In these cases, have is an action verb, and it can be used in continuous form. Look is another verb that can be both stative and an action. Look is a stative verb when referring to something's appearance. For example, that cake looks delicious. Look is an action verb when talking about directing your eyes to something, or in phrasal verbs. For example, he's looking at the computer screen, meaning he is directing his eyes to the computer screen. She's looking for a job, meaning she's seeking a job. They're looking after my dog for the weekend. Looking after means taking care of. Smell and taste are state of verbs when describing the quality of smell or taste possessed by something. For example, the bar smells of smoke, or this meat tastes like chicken. Smell and taste are action verbs when a person uses their nose or mouth to test something. For example. He's smelling the cookies. She's tasting the soup to see if it needs salt. Think and feel are state of verbs when talking about your opinion. For example, I think that's a great idea. I feel that this is not the best use of our time. Think and feel are action verbs when using your mind or experiencing emotions or health issues. For example, we're thinking about moving to another city. Thinking about means considering. It is an action you do with your mind, not an opinion. I've been feeling unusually tired lately. Feeling is an emotion or health issue. Again, not an opinion. So, feel in this case is an action verb, and we can use the continuous form. Finally, weigh and measure are stative when talking about the quality possessed by something. For example, the suitcase weighs twenty pounds. The room measures five meters by seven meters. And they are action verbs when a person performs the action of doing it. For example, the butcher is weighing the meat on the scale. 
The architects were measuring the distance between the pillars. If you're a more experienced English student who wants to master the more complex details of English grammar, take the Advanced English Grammar course available at EspressoEnglish.net. If you register by November 5th, you'll get a special discount on the price of the course. Visit EspressoEnglish.net to register for the Advanced English Grammar course. Positive Verbs in English Let, Make, Have, Get, and Help from EspressoEnglish.net The English verbs let, make, have, get, and help are called causative verbs because they cause something else to happen. Here are some examples of how causative verbs work in English sentences. Let's start with the word let. It means to permit something to happen. The grammatical structure is let plus the person or thing plus the base form of the verb. We do not use to with let. For example, I don't let my kids watch violent movies. Again, the correct structure is let my kids watch. Don't say let my kids to watch. That's incorrect. Mary's father won't let her adopt a puppy because he's allergic to dogs. Our boss doesn't let us eat lunch at our desks. We have to eat in the cafeteria. Oops, I wasn't paying attention while cooking, and I let the food burn. Don't let the advertising expenses surpass a thousand dollars. Remember that the past tense of let is also let. There is no change. The verbs allow and permit are more formal ways to say let. However, with allow and permit, we use to plus the verb. For example, I don't allow my kids to watch violent movies. Our boss doesn't permit us to eat lunch at our desks. Now let's look at the verb make. This means to force or require someone to take an action. The grammatical structure is make plus the person plus the base form of the verb. Again, we don't use the word to. For example, after Billy broke the neighbor's window, his parents made him pay for it. Remember, we use the base form, pay, and not to pay. My ex-boyfriend loved sci-fi and made me watch every episode of his favorite show. The teacher made all the students rewrite their papers because the first drafts were not acceptable. When using the verbs force and require as an alternative to make, then we must use to plus the verb. For example, the school requires the students to wear uniforms. The word require often implies that there is a rule. The hijacker forced the pilots to take the plane in a different direction. The word force often implies violence, threats, or extremely strong pressure. Our next causative verb is have. This means to give someone else the responsibility to do something, and there are two possible grammatical structures. Have plus the person plus the base form of the verb, or have plus the thing plus the past participle. Here are some examples of grammatical structure number one. I'll have my assistant call you to reschedule the appointment. The businessman had his secretary make copies of the report. And here are some examples of grammatical structure number two. I'm going to have my hair cut tomorrow. In this structure, we don't say who cuts the hair, but the hair will be cut by somebody. We're having our house painted this weekend. Again, we don't say who does the action. We focus more on the object, the receiver of the action, our house, which will receive the action of being painted. Bob had his teeth whitened. His smile looks great. My washing machine is broken. I need to have it repaired.
In informal speech, we often use get in these cases. For example, I'm going to get my hair cut tomorrow. We're getting our house painted this weekend. Bob got his teeth whitened. His smile looks great. My washing machine is broken. I need to get it repaired. We can also use the verb get to mean convince or encourage someone to do something. And the grammatical structure is get plus the person plus to plus the verb. For example, how can we get all the employees to arrive on time? In this sentence, the word get means to convince or encourage the employees to arrive on time. My husband hates housework. I can never get him to wash the dishes. I was nervous about eating sushi. But my brother got me to try it at a Japanese restaurant. The nonprofit got a professional photographer to take photos at the event for free. Finally, we have the word help, meaning to assist someone in doing something. With help, we can have two possible grammatical structures: help plus the person plus the base form of the verb, or help plus the person plus to plus the verb. After help, you can use to or not. Both ways are correct. In general, the form without to is more common. For example, he helped me carry the boxes, or he helped me to carry the boxes. Reading before bed helps me relax, or reading before bed helps me to relax. Again, both are correct, but the form without the word to is more common in everyday English. If you want to learn advanced English grammar, check out the Advanced English Grammar course at EspressoEnglish.net. This course has 45 lessons that will help you master the advanced details of the English language, and it also includes personal feedback on your written English. Visit EspressoEnglish.net for the Advanced English Grammar course. Take your English from good to great. Do you hate phrasal verbs? Are you confused by the differences between take up, take in, take out, take off, take away, take over, and take back? Phrasal verbs can make it difficult to understand spoken English, even if you've studied the language for a long time. Many students learn English from textbooks, but when they visit an English-speaking country or talk with a native speaker, their understanding is limited because the textbook didn't focus on the phrasal verbs that are so common in everyday spoken English. If you want to be fluent in English, you need to know phrasal verbs and how they are used in everyday situations and conversations. This course will teach you 500 phrasal verbs in only 10 minutes a day. It's not just memorizing lists; that's not very effective, and it's boring too. Instead, you'll learn the phrasal verbs in context through stories and conversations, as well as practice exercises to help you use the phrasal verbs in your English immediately. When you register, you'll instantly get 30 phrasal verbs in conversation lessons that you can download and save to your computer. The course costs $30. That's just $1 per lesson, and you can pay by credit card, debit card, PayPal, PagSeguro, or bank deposit in Brazil. Click the buttons under this video to take lesson one for free, or register and download the complete course instantly. Thanks for watching and enjoy the course. Ten English phrasal verbs about socializing, from EspressoEnglish.net. Number one, ask someone over. If you ask someone over, it means you invite the person to your house or apartment. For example. We asked our English teacher over for lunch. Number two, ask someone out. If you ask someone out, it means you invite the person to go out for a date. 
a romantic encounter. Bill was nervous, but he finally asked Jessica out, and she said yes. Number three, come over. If a person comes over, they go visit your home. If you come over after class, we can work on the project together. Number four, bring over, to bring an object to someone's home. I'll bring over my DVD collection so that we can watch some movies. Number five, have someone over. This is the general phrasal verb for having someone visit your home. We had about fifteen people over for Christmas dinner. Number six, pop in, stop in, and stop by. These all mean to visit for a short period of time. I just stopped by to say hi. I'm on my way to dance class. Number seven, drop in, to visit unexpectedly. My sister always drops in when I'm in the middle of something important. I wish she'd call first. Number eight, drop someone off. When you take someone in your car and then leave them at another place, my husband's flight leaves at four thirty, so I'll drop him off at the airport by two. Number nine, pick someone up. When you go to a place and get someone in your car, this is the opposite of drop someone off. My husband gets back from London tomorrow, and I need to pick him up from the airport. Number ten, meet up with someone, to get together at a particular place and time. I'm going to meet up with some friends at the bar around eight thirty. Thanks for watching English tips from Espresso English. If you liked this video, please share it. Seven English phrasal verbs with the word cut from EspressoEnglish.net. Number one, cut across, to go across or through a place, not around it, to make the trip faster. Let's cut across the park on the way home from school. It'll be quicker. Number two, cut back on or cut down on. To reduce, especially spending or eating, we're cutting back on expenses to save up for our next vacation. I need to cut down on fast food to lose some weight by summer. Number three, cut in, to enter a conversation by interrupting. I couldn't have a serious discussion with Barry because William kept cutting in. There's also the expression "cut in line," that means to enter a line ahead of other people who have been waiting longer. Number four, cut it out. Say this to tell someone to stop doing something annoying. For example, if your kids are running around the house screaming and yelling, you can say, "Cut it out." I'm trying to take a nap. Number five, cut off, remove something from something bigger. For example, I cut the tags off my new shirt. Cut off is also used when the telephone disconnects accidentally. For example, we were cut off in the middle of our conversation. Cut off also means to stop the supply of something. Our electricity was cut off after we didn't pay the bill for three months. Cut off can mean to interrupt, often in the middle of a sentence. I tried to explain the problem, but she cut me off and said she didn't want to hear about it. Cut off also means when one car suddenly drives in front of another car.
He got angry when another car cut him off on the highway. Cut out, to remove something like a picture from something else, like a magazine. I cut the article out of the newspaper. If you cut someone out, it means you exclude them. Helen cut her ex-boyfriend out of her life. She doesn't even want to see him. Cut out also means when an engine, motor, or machine completely stops. I was terrified when the plane's engine suddenly cut out. Number seven, cut up, to cut with scissors or a knife into small pieces. The teacher cut up the paper into triangles. Thanks for watching English tips from Espresso English. If you liked this video, please share it. Twelve English phrasal verbs with the word run from EspressoEnglish.net Number one, run after, to chase or pursue. I ran after the bus, but it didn't stop for me. Number two, run around. This literally means to run around an area. The kids are running around the neighborhood. Run around can also mean to be very busy doing many things. Sorry I haven't had time to call you. I've been running around between work, school, and soccer practice. Number three, run away to run in the opposite direction from something. The dog is running away from the boy. Run away can also mean when a child or teenager leaves home because of problems. She ran away from home because her father was abusive. Number four, run for. Try to be elected for a political or leadership position. Mark is running for state senator. That means he is a candidate for this position. Number five, run into. If you run into someone, it means you meet the person unexpectedly. I ran into my English teacher at the mall. You can also say run into a problem, which means encounter a problem. I ran into a few problems when I tried to install the software, so I called tech support. Another expression is run into a brick wall. This means to encounter an obstacle that is difficult or impossible to overcome. The peace negotiations ran into a brick wall when both leaders refused to compromise. Number six, run off. This phrasal verb is used specifically for making photocopies. I need to run off 200 copies of this report. You can also say run off with someone when a married person abandons their husband or wife and stays together with a new lover. For example, he left his wife and children and ran off with a supermodel. Number seven, run on, be powered by. This car runs on electricity, not gasoline. Number eight, run out of have none left, no more available. The car ran out of gas. Number nine, run over, to hit with a vehicle, like a car or train. My dog died when he was run over by a truck. Run over can also mean to take more time than planned. The meeting ran over 20 minutes, so I was late for my next appointment. Number 10. Run through. Explain quickly. Before we leave, let me run through the schedule for the tour. 
run through can also mean to quickly practice a play, song, performance, or presentation. I'd like to run through the presentation one more time to make sure everything's perfect. Number 11. Run up. Run to someone or something. As soon as I get home from work, my kids run up to me and hug me. Run up can also mean to spend a lot of money on credit. My parents ran up a debt of $20,000 on their credit cards. Number 12. Run with. Informal. To spend time with people, usually bad people. My son has been running with a bad crowd. His friends like to cut class. Run with can also mean to continue with an idea or begin implementing it. I like your idea for the party decorations. Let's run with it. Thanks for watching English Tips from Espresso English. If you liked this video, please share it. Eighteen meanings for ten phrasal verbs with put from EspressoEnglish.net Number 1. Put away means place an object in its proper location. For example, here are your clean clothes, please put them away, meaning put them in the closet, in the dresser, etc. Number 2. Put back means return an object to the location where it came from. This is the opposite of take something out. For example, after you're done using the dictionary, put it back. Number three, put down means write on a piece of paper. Sometimes we just say put without down. For example, I'm making a shopping list. I already put down bread, cheese, and butter. What else do we need? Or, I already put bread, cheese, and butter. Put down can also mean to criticize and humiliate someone. For example, every time I try to add something to the conversation, my brother puts me down by saying my opinions are stupid. Finally, put down can mean to kill an animal that is old, sick, or suffering. For example, when our cat got cancer, we decided to put her down. Number four, put forth or put forward. To offer an idea, plan, or proposal for consideration. For example, I'd like to put forward a couple of suggestions. Number five, put off, means to delay doing something, procrastinate. For example, I've been putting off this assignment for the past week. I just can't seem to get started. Put off can also mean to make a bad impression. For example, she seemed unfriendly. Her attitude really put me off. Number six, put on. To start wearing or using clothing, makeup, or accessories. For example, she put on her boots and got ready to go out in the rain. Put on can also mean to produce a show or performance. For example, the local theater company is putting on Romeo and Juliet. Finally, put on is a slang word meaning to trick or deceive someone. For example, you won the lottery? No way! You're putting me on, right? Another similar expression is, you're kidding, or you're joking. Number seven, put out, 
means to extinguish a fire or cigarette. For electric lights we use turn off instead. For example, the firefighters quickly put out the fire in the apartment building. Put out can also mean to publish a regular or frequent publication. For example, the organization puts out a monthly newsletter. Finally, put out can mean to inconvenience someone. For example, is it okay if I arrive early? I don't want to put you out in any way. Number 8. Put through means to transfer or connect someone on the telephone. For example, the customer service representative couldn't help me, so he put me through to a manager. Number 9. Put someone up means to give someone a place to stay temporarily at your home. For example, don't worry about finding a hotel. I can put you up for a few days. To put someone up to something means to encourage or persuade the person to do something, often something mischievous. For example, my son is normally very well behaved, but his friends put him up to playing a prank on the teacher. Number 10. Put up with means to tolerate or accept an annoying situation or behavior. For example, I can't put up with all the noise in the dormitory. I need a quieter place to study. To learn 500 phrasal verbs in everyday spoken English, take the Phrasal Verbs in Conversation course available at EspressoEnglish.net. You'll learn phrasal verbs easily and naturally in the context of dialogues about everyday topics. Visit EspressoEnglish.net to take the Phrasal Verbs in Conversation course. Ten Common English Phrasal Verbs with Come from EspressoEnglish.net Number 1. Come across means to find something by accident. For example, when I was cleaning my room, I came across my middle school diaries. Number 2. Come along means to accompany someone when going somewhere. For example, we're going to get ice cream. Want to come along? Number three, come back, means return. For example, he's still hoping his ex-girlfriend will come back to him even after all these years. Number four, come off, when something becomes separated or unstuck from another thing. For example, the paint is starting to come off the wall in the kitchen. Number five, come on. The phrasal verb come on has multiple uses, but when used as an exclamation, it can be encouragement for someone to do something, or it can mean something like stop being ridiculous. For example, I don't want to dance. I'm no good at it. Everyone will laugh at me. Oh, come on. Nobody here cares whether or not you can dance. Number six, come out means appear or leave the inside of a place. For example, it's cloudy right now, but the sun should come out later. My little brother is hiding under the covers and doesn't want to come out. Number seven, come over, means come to someone's house. For example, if you come over tomorrow after school, I'll help you with your homework. Number eight, come through means produce or deliver a result. For example, I thought my favorite basketball team would lose the game, but the offense came through and scored 15 points in the last five minutes. Number nine, come up, means appear, often used for when a task or responsibility appears unexpectedly, 
or when a topic appears in a discussion. For example, I'm sorry I missed your birthday party. Something came up at the last minute, and I couldn't go. I thought someone would mention the policy change, but it didn't come up during the meeting. Number ten, come up with, means create or invent something. For example, every time I ask him to do something, he always comes up with a list of excuses for why he can't do it. Do you want to learn phrasal verbs the natural way? Check out the phrasal verbs and conversation course at espressoenglish.net. It will help you learn phrasal verbs easily and naturally in the context of everyday spoken English. Visit espressoenglish.net and check out the phrasal verbs and conversation course. Do you know these ten English phrasal verbs from espressoenglish.net? In this lesson, I will show you a sentence with three options to complete the phrasal verb. Choose an answer, and after ten seconds, I will show which one is correct. Ready? Let's begin. Number one. We invited a lot of people to the party, but only a few. Up. The correct answer is showed. The phrasal verb show up means to appear or when people attend an event. Number two. He got very angry and started yelling. Everyone told him to calm. The correct answer is down. The phrasal verb calm down means to stop being angry or agitated. Number three. I can't believe I into a friend of mine from childhood at the festival. I hadn't seen her in twenty years. The correct answer is bumped. The phrasal verb bump into someone means to encounter the person unexpectedly. Number four. My daughter loves to make stories. She's very imaginative. Maybe she'll be a writer someday. The correct answer is up. Make up means to invent stories or facts from your imagination. Number five. We set on our road trip at around 5 a.m. The correct answer is off. The phrasal verbs set off and set out mean to start a journey. Number six. Three months later, he's still upset that he didn't get the job. He should just get it already. The correct answer is over. To get over something means to overcome an emotional difficulty or problem. Number seven. During the meeting, she up a lot of issues that had been problematic for a long time.
The correct answer is brought. The phrasal verb bring up means to introduce a topic into a conversation or discussion. Number 8. While we were exploring the city, we came a wonderful antique shop. The correct answer is across. The phrasal verb come across means to find something unexpectedly. Number 9. My parents expected me to get good grades and I always studied hard so that I wouldn't them down. The correct answer is let. To let someone down means to disappoint them. Number 10. The woman was handing free samples of perfume. The correct answer is out. The phrasal verbs hand out and give out mean distribute to many people. To learn many more phrasal verbs with lots of practice exercises, take the Phrasal Verbs course available at EspressoEnglish.net. It teaches you phrasal verbs in conversation, so you'll learn them easily and naturally in context. Visit EspressoEnglish.net to take the Phrasal Verbs course. Ten phrasal verbs you probably don't know from EspressoEnglish.net Number 1. Beef up. Make something greater or stronger. The city of Rio de Janeiro will beef up security for the Olympics in 2016. This means that Rio will be increasing the number of police and taking stronger measures to eliminate violence and make the city safe. Number 2. Bounce an idea off someone. Present the idea to a person or group to get their opinion or reaction to it. I have a few different ideas for our advertising campaign. Could I bounce them off you? This is a sentence you could say to your boss or colleague. It means you will talk about your ideas and the boss or colleague will give you his or her opinion, feedback, or suggestions. Number 3. Bristle at something. Show sudden anger or annoyance in reaction to something. Carla bristled at Dan's comment that her mother was too intrusive. The word bristle refers to the way that dogs and cats react to a threat. The fur on their backs stands up, indicating that the animal is angry. You can say a person bristled at a comment or situation if they react like a threatened animal. Number 4. Clam up. Stop talking and refuse to say anything more. My teenage son talks a lot about sports, but when I ask him about school, he clams up. This animal is called a clam. When a clam closes its shell, it's very hard to open it. In the same way, a person who closes their mouth and won't open it is said to clam up. Number 5. Crow about or crow over. To brag, talk arrogantly about something. 
When Brian got promoted, he wouldn't stop crowing about his new six-figure salary. This bird is called a crow. The song of a crow is rather loud and annoying. In the same way, a person who talks arrogantly about themselves or about some success is said to be crowing over it, because it's usually annoying to listen. Number six, fawn over someone or something, give excessive attention, admiration, or affection. I have three daughters, but everyone fawns over the youngest one. You can fawn over a person or an object. For example, many people fawn over celebrities or especially talented or beautiful people. It's also common to fawn over new products, like when a man buys a big motorcycle and all his friends fawn over it. Number seven, size someone up. Look at the person and make a quick evaluation. Shannon sized up her opponent for the final round of the karate tournament. The phrasal verb "size up" is often used in sports when one player or team is looking at the other player or team and trying to evaluate them. But you can also use it in other situations, like sizing someone up when they appear for a job interview or a first date. Number eight, plod along, move forward slowly and deliberately. I got stuck behind a slow driver. He was just plodding along, admiring the scenery. The phrasal verb "plod along" can refer to slow physical movement, like driving or walking, or it can refer to slow progress in a project or a movie. Number nine, wipe out, to kill, eliminate, or destroy something or someone. The pollution has wiped out most of the fish in the river. This phrasal verb can be used for war and genocide, like when one people group wipes out another group. It can also be used for animals, as in the example, as well as objects. For example, a new cancer medicine that completely wipes out a tumor. Number ten, mull over something. To think about or consider it very carefully. After mulling over the decision for three days, she chose not to take the job. You can also use think over or think through, but mull over implies an even deeper level of consideration. People often mull over philosophical, ethical, or religious questions. If you want to learn more phrasal verbs, check out our intensive course "Phrasal Verbs in Conversation," where you'll learn 500 phrasal verbs in everyday spoken English through dialogues and examples. Thanks for watching English Tips from Espresso English. If you liked this video, please share it. Hi and welcome to the webinar. Today I'll be teaching you ten phrasal verbs with multiple meanings. Now, to refresh your memory, a phrasal verb is a two or three word verb with a main verb and a preposition, like the example in the picture. Take off. Now, phrasal verbs are very similar to each other. For example, we have take off, take out, take on, take over, take up. And all of these are different. And also, one phrasal verb can have multiple meanings. Take off can refer to an airplane going up into the air. 
Take off can mean to remove something. For example, take off your jacket or take off your shoes. And we have three more meanings. Take off can mean increase fast in success and popularity. For example, if a new video game takes off, it means that a lot of people start using and playing the video game. Take off is also an informal way to say leave. For example, you can tell your friends, "I've got to take off. I'll see you guys later." That means I have to leave. And finally, we also use take off when you stop working or studying for a period of time. For example, I took two weeks off from work. So in today's lesson, I'm going to teach you ten of these phrasal verbs, which have two, three, or even more meanings. So here's how today's class will work. I will show you an example sentence. You'll try to guess what the phrasal verb means in context, and you can type your answer in the box, or you can just think about it to yourself. And then I will explain and give some more examples. Now, why do I ask you to guess what the phrasal verb means? Because I think this is a good way for you to practice figuring out. New English expressions from their context. So even if you get the answer wrong, it's okay. This is good practice for you. All right. And if you want to learn 500 phrasal verbs, then definitely check out the Phrasal Verbs in Conversation course, which uses a similar method. In that course, you also have the chance to learn the phrasal verbs in context through conversations. So there's a button under this webinar for the phrasal verbs in conversation course, and if you're interested, check it out. Okay, let's get started. Phrasal verb number one: pass out. The teacher passed out the tests to the students. What do you think "passed out" means in this context? Right. This is an easy one. Pass out means to give or distribute, and we can talk about a teacher passing out tests or worksheets in the classroom, or passing out promotional material in public, like passing out flyers, passing out coupons, or sometimes free samples. Like if you have a new cafe, sometimes they pass out free samples of food on the street to help attract customers. Now here's another example sentence. It was so hot in the classroom that I felt like I was going to pass out. Now what does pass out mean in this context? Okay, some people are saying fall asleep or feel sick. Pass out in this context means to faint, to lose consciousness. People can pass out from shock when something scares them, from fear. People can pass out if they're very nervous, or people can pass out from medical problems like low blood pressure. Now, if you get hit on the head with an impact, then we usually say you get knocked out instead of pass out. Okay, pass out usually doesn't involve an impact. So those are two different meanings for the phrasal verb pass out. Let's go to number two. Bring up. Her parents died when she was very young, so her grandparents brought her up. What do you think "brought her up" means? Good. A few people are getting it. Bring up means to raise, care for, and educate a child. To teach a child good behavior.、Um, And we're not talking about formal education here. We're talking about parents teaching children good behavior, for example. Now, don't get "bring up" confused with "grow up." A child grows up; he becomes bigger and older and taller. But the parents or the adults bring up the child. They care for and educate the child. Okay. Now, here's a totally different way to use "bring up." That's a great idea. You should bring it up at tomorrow's meeting. What does "bring up" mean here?
Oh, you guys are smart. Bring up means introduce a topic into a conversation or discussion, and you can bring up an idea, bring up a suggestion, or bring up something negative like bring up an objection or bring up a problem. It just means to introduce or start talking about that topic in a general conversation or discussion. So that's another way to use bring up. Number three. Take out. He took his phone out of his pocket. What do you think "take out" means? Exactly, it means to remove something from inside a place. So you can take your phone out of your pocket, like you can see in the picture. When you get to school, you take your books out of your backpack. Um, when you buy a new product, you need to take the product out of the box, and so on. That's pretty self-explanatory. Now, here's a slightly different way to use "take out." I took out ten library books. What does "take out" mean in this case? It's similar, but it's not exactly the same. Okay, good. In this context, "take out" means borrow. It means you remove the books from the library, but you will need to give them back. And we only use "take out" in this case for taking books out of the library, or taking books out from the library, or taking a loan—that's money—out from the bank. You take the books or take the money out, but you will need to give it back later. Okay. Now, meaning number three for "take out." John is taking my sister out to dinner on Friday. What does "take out" mean here? Good job. A few people got it. "Take out" means to bring someone on a social encounter, and it may be romantic. For example, taking your girlfriend out to dinner or taking somebody out to see a movie. Or it may not be. You can also take a colleague out to lunch, or your parents can take you out to see a baseball game. And taking someone out usually means you invite them, and usually that you also pay for them. So you pay for their dinner or pay for their movie ticket. Okay. So to take someone out means to bring someone and to pay for their experience, their meal or ticket. Let's look at take up. Imagine you're moving into a new apartment, and you look at the apartment and you say, "There's no room for a bookcase because the couch takes up too much space." What does take up mean? Right, take up means to fill or occupy time or space. So, for example, you can see in the picture this is a really big couch, and it takes up, it fills all the space, so that there's not enough room for a bookcase. Again, you can use "take up" with space or time. For example, responding to email takes up a lot of my time. That's true, by the way. I get a lot of email from students. Okay, here's a different way to use "take up." I've just taken up skiing. I've had two lessons so far. What does "take up" mean here? Take up means to start, to start a sport, activity, or hobby. Okay, that's also pretty easy to understand. Number five, back up. You should back up your files so that you won't lose them if your computer crashes. What do you think "back up" means? I see we have some computer experts in the classroom. Yes, "back up" means make a copy of computer data or information. It's to make an extra copy of that computer data, and you can make a backup on a server. You can make a backup on a hard drive, or a CD, or a USB drive. The important thing is to have an extra copy of the information. So, if your computer 
crashes, if it breaks, or if you lose your computer, if it's stolen, you have an extra copy of your data. Okay, and we have two ways to use this word. Back up, two words, is the verb. And back up, one word, is the noun, referring to the extra copy of the data. Now here's a different meaning. He crashed his car into a tree while backing up. What does backing up mean here? Right, to move backwards, to move the car in reverse. And we can use back up for cars. We can also use back up for people when you're walking and you take some steps backwards. And when you're walking, we can also use back away. We usually back away from danger. Like if you see an angry dog, you would back away from the dog uh, so that it doesn't bite you, okay? A third way to use back up. My coworkers backed me up when I complained that the boss was giving us too much work. What does back up mean here? This one's a little more difficult. To back someone up means to give moral or emotional support for someone's position. So in this example sentence, I'm complaining about overwork and if my coworkers back me up, it means they agree with and support me in that opinion or in that position, okay? To back up, to back someone up is to give support to that person. Here's another way to use back up. There's a ton of traffic. The highway is backed up for miles. Have you ever experienced this? What does back up mean here? Back up means to accumulate and delay due to excess. So the most common ways we use back up with this meaning is when talking about roads. You can say the road is all backed up because there are so many cars that it's slow or stopped. Um, you can say your toilet is backed up. That means it's blocked and the water can't go through. That's a very bad situation. And you can also say that your schedule is backed up. For example, um, imagine that you have a store and your store gets a lot of orders around Christmas time and you get so many customers that you have delays in sending out the orders. So you would say, we're all backed up. I can't ship your order for another uh, two weeks, for example. So a road can be backed up, a toilet can be backed up, or a schedule can be backed up, okay? Blow up. The factory blew up due to a gas leak and three people were killed. What does blow up mean? Right, you got it, to explode, okay? This can be used for any type of explosion, um, bombs or accidents. Um, it can be used for big or small explosions. Now, a different way to use blow up. The CEO, that's the president, the president of a company, the CEO blew up when he found out that his mistake had lost the company a billion dollars. What does blow up mean in this context? It's similar, but it's more metaphorical. Blow up can mean to explode in anger. When someone gets angry very suddenly, very quickly, they lose control. They lose their temper. We say they blew up, okay? So that's not a literal explosion. It's an explosion of emotion, angry emotion. Number seven, give away. If you haven't worn a piece of clothing in more than a year, you should give it away. What do you think give away means? Good job. Give away means to give something to someone for free, okay? Different from selling it, you give it for free. Like you can see in the picture, people donating their old clothing, giving it to other people for free. 
Here's another way to use giveaway. I don't want to give away the end of the movie. You'll have to see it for yourself. What do you think giveaway means in this sentence? In this case, giveaway means to reveal secret information. And we usually talk about giving away the end of books or giving away the end of a movie. You don't want to give away the end of a movie or a book to someone who hasn't seen it or read it yet because then you'll ruin the surprise for that person. And sometimes we also talk about giving away company secrets or strategies. Um, one example is that Coca-Cola definitely doesn't want to give away their recipe for Coke because then everybody would be able to produce it. So give away, another meaning for it is to reveal secret information. Number eight, work out. I need to lose weight, so I'm going to work out at least three times a week. What do you think work out means here? To exercise, that's right. Um, working out can mean any type of exercise. It can mean exercise you do with only your body, like yoga um, or any types of exercises. Or it can mean exercising with objects or with machines. So lifting weights or using an exercise machine. Working out can refer to running as well. Any type of exercise can be called working out, okay? Now, what about this sentence? There were a number of problems during the project, but everything worked out fine in the end. What's your best guess for what worked out means in this situation? It means it resolved. It had a positive outcome. And we usually use worked out in this way when there were some difficulties or challenges in the process, but in the end, everything was okay. We say everything worked out or we worked out the problems. We resolved the problems. Okay, so that's a different meaning for work out. Number nine, make up. I didn't know the answer to the question, so I just made something up. What does make up mean in this case? It means to invent, invent a story or invent some information that is not true. It's just coming from your imagination. Um, children often make up stories or make up imaginary friends. Um, one thing you don't want to do is make up information if you're a journalist. Um, that's not good. You need to report the facts and not make up, invent false facts. Okay, so make up means to invent something, usually a story or a piece of information. Now, how about this? After not speaking to each other for a month, my daughter and her best friend finally made up. What does that mean, they finally made up? If you make up with a person, it means you restore a good relationship after an argument or fight. So in this case, we have two girls who had an argument or a disagreement or a fight, and they didn't speak to each other for a month, but then eventually they made up. They became friends again, and they restored their good relationship. Okay, so when two people make up, it means they come back to having a good relationship after a disagreement or argument. Now, how about this? I bought my mother a nice gift to try to make up for missing her birthday party. What do you think make up means here? Wow, you guys are really good. To make up means to compensate in this situation. So I missed my mother's birthday party. My mother's probably sad or upset or angry. And so I buy her a nice gift to compensate for my mistake or my absence at her party. 
And there are two ways to use make up in this way. You can say make up for a mistake or make up for bad behavior, or you can say make it up to a person. So one sentence you'll hear. If your friend does something that makes you angry or upset,、um, they might say, "How can I make it up to you?" It means, "How can I compensate for my error? How can I, how can I do something good that will balance out the bad thing that I did? How can I make it up to you?" Okay, make up meaning to compensate. Now we also have the word makeup, one word which means cosmetics. That's、uh, lipstick and eyeshadow and other things that women usually, but also actors and actresses, put on their face to make them more beautiful. That's a noun, and that's one word: makeup, cosmetics. Okay. And our last phrasal verb, pick up, has many meanings. I picked up the toys that my kids left all over the floor. What does "picked up" mean here? Good. This is the easiest and simplest meaning. To pick up means to take something, usually with your hand, and bring it up from a surface. So here in the picture, you can see the toys all over the floor, and the kid's mother or father needs to pick up the toys, get them. Up off the floor and put them away in their proper places. Now, how about this? I'll be back in an hour. I need to pick up a few things at the store. It's not exactly the same meaning as the previous one. What does "pick up" mean here? Pick up means to buy. It's an informal or casual way to say. You're going to buy something. You would usually pick up、um, food at the grocery store. You can pick up something on your way home from work.、Uh, for example, you're driving home and you remember that you don't have any soap at home, so you stop at the convenience store to pick up some soap. We usually don't use "pick up" for major purchases, like you wouldn't pick up a diamond necklace or pick up a new car, because those are usually things you need to think about buying and research. So, "pick up" is a way to talk about casual or informal purchases. Here's another one. Sure, I can give you a ride. The concert starts at eight, so I'll pick you up around seven fifteen. What does "pick you up" mean? Pick someone up means to get someone in your car to take them to a place. So, if your friend doesn't have a car but they need to go somewhere, you can say, "I'll pick you up. I will get you in my car to take you somewhere." And the opposite of "pick up" or "pick someone up" is "drop the person off." So, for example, if your friend is returning from a trip, you can pick them up at the airport and then drop them off at their house. A fourth meaning for pick up: When we moved to Spain, my kids picked up Spanish within three months. How about picked up here? What does it mean? Right, it means to learn, and usually to learn quickly and casually, not in a formal classroom environment. So, in this example sentence, when I say my kids picked up Spanish, it means they learned it naturally from their friends, from TV,、um, from day-to-day -day life. Not that they were in a classroom; they just picked it up. They learned it naturally and easily. And finally, a fifth meaning for pick up: sales are slow over the summer, but they usually pick up around September. What does pick up mean in this context? Take your best guess. Right, pick up means to increase or improve. Often after a period of decrease or no change, so you can see from. The little diagram that I have 
no real major change in sales, but then it starts to go up, and we say that sales pick up when they suddenly start to go up a little bit. Usually, not a big increase, but it's a change in the positive direction. And we usually use "pick up" in this way when talking about the economy, sales, or growth. Okay, so that's five different ways to use the phrasal verb "pick up." Well, you guys did great in this webinar, and I hope you've learned some new meanings for phrasal verbs. And if you want to continue learning phrasal verbs in context, specifically in the context of conversation, more conversational spoken English, you'll really enjoy the phrasal verbs in conversation course. This was one of my favorite courses to produce because. You learn directly from dialogues, which makes it easier and more interesting. And the dialogues are full of the phrasal verbs that we use in everyday life all the time. So each lesson starts with a dialogue with lots of phrasal verbs, and then continues with an explanation of those phrasal verbs, including more examples and when to use and when not to use each phrasal verb. And the lessons in this course also include lots of practice exercises because I think it's really important not just to study, but also to use the new words that you're learning. So I included quizzes with the phrasal verbs to help you remember them, and also some writing exercises where you can practice. Writing sentences with the phrasal verbs, and you can even send them to me for correction. The course is thirty lessons with audio, video, and text. And when you register for it, you get permanent online access. There's no time limit. Okay, so there's thirty lessons, but you can take them any time, and you can also download all the lessons to your computer or to your smartphone or tablet to make it more convenient. For you, and to be able to study, even if you don't have an internet connection. All right. So, if you're interested in taking phrasal verbs in conversation, just click the button under this webinar, and you'll get more information and registration for the phrasal verbs course. Well, I normally take questions at the end of the webinar, but unfortunately, we're just about out of time. So I'm going to respond to all of your questions by email. Okay. So if you have a question about the phrasal verbs you learned today, or about the phrasal verbs course, or about any other aspect of English, you can type your question in the box. Or you can email me directly. My email address is help at espressoenglish dot net, and I will respond to you by email within a couple of days. Okay, and I will also type up the notes from this webinar and send them out to you so that you can have the text、um, of today's webinar about phrasal verbs with multiple meanings. I hope you guys enjoyed today's class. It was great to have your participation. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope to see you in the phrasal verbs course and also in the next webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye.